welcome to another episode of the Horn Call podcast. My name is James Bold, and I'm the publications editor for the International Horn Society, and I'm delighted to be your host. We're coming up on the one-year anniversary of this podcast, and it's it's hard to believe, and reflecting back on uh, some of the amazing guests that I've had the privilege and honor of speaking with, um, I'm just uh, inspired and amazed by their accolades, their their joy at doing what they do and the contributions that they're making to horn players uh, all over the world. And today's guest, Robert Lee Watt, is no exception to that. Uh, Mr. Watt, or Bob, was the first African-American horn player to be hired by a major American symphony orchestra, the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Uh, He retired from that orchestra in 2007 after a career of 37 years in the orchestra. Uh, In addition to performing with uh, international artists uh, in the L.A. Philharmonic. He also was uh, active as a studio player uh, around Los Angeles and uh, worked with just uh, an incredible array of of diverse uh, musicians and artists. We talked about, obviously, his experiences as a musician in in the L.A. Philharmonic, um, making the transition from living on the East Coast, where he attended the New New England Conservatory, making that transition to Los Angeles. Angeles. There are um, some stories in there about Miles Davis and his uh, uh, his friendship with him. Uh, I would add that uh, Bob created a short film called Missing Miles, which is based on a composition by the composer and producer Todd Cochran, which Bob commissioned. Uh, the, that short film was recently chosen by the Pan-African Film Festival as one of the selections. Bob is a true Renaissance man, a man of many talents and interests. Uh, I, I don't think a one-hour podcast can, can do him justice in that regard. But hopefully it will give you a a taste of uh, the kind of person and and the the intellect and talent that that he's got. If you'd like to know more and if this interview today whets your appetite for more details and more of the many, many interesting stories that Bob has to tell, I encourage you to read a three-part interview with Bob uh, by Mary Rich in the February, May, and October 2021 issues of The Horn Call. February and May are already out, and October will be shortly on the way, so be sure to check those out. I will say that some of the stories, especially those uh, associated with Miles Davis, I did censor the language a little bit. Um, I encouraged Bob to just kind of speak freely and, you know, tell me the stories as they happen. Uh, But in order to make our podcast... um, accessible and and suitable for listening by uh, audiences of of all ages uh some some of the language has been edited out but i do hope that the spirit and and character of those stories does come through uh anyone that was familiar with miles davis or has read anything about him will will probably understand what i'm saying and uh i i think i think the character of the stories as i said i think i think it comes through regardless of the the censoring of of the language there. But uh, I don't want to go on too long. I want to make sure and give you plenty of time to listen to our conversation with Bob Watt. Uh, I'm I'm excited that you're here today, and I've got lots of questions. But um, maybe a good place to start would be to maybe kind of talk about what, what life has been like for you during this quarantine. You're out in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, not. I think that uh, when I look around, I mean, it's a huge city, and uh, there's some things that are very strange. But I to see certain things shut down. You know, I mean, this country's got so much. So many resources, it's a shame that we got mm-hmm. caught like that kind of with our pants down. But I think in general, in spite of all that, that the people themselves, the American people, rose to the occasion. And it, it is heartening despite all of the, you know, calamity and things going on, it, especially among musicians. There seems to be, at least among a lot of musicians, there's there's a bond, some camaraderie, the way orchestras that are not working right now have kind of banded together with other groups of musicians and tried to tried to support one another. So I, I, I think that's a positive thing. Yeah. I, and I think 
as a horn player back east, uh, Marshall Seeley, mm-hmm. came up with. He's a he's a master repairman also, and a very you know an amazing tinkerer. And you know he made a mask that <laughs> the mouthpiece goes through the mask because mm-hmm. he, he was playing a job and they weren't wearing masks. And he said, I didn't want to you know I wanted to protect myself, so he made a mask with a hole in it. I think we may have seen one in the was it one in the mag one of the, the October issue of. Probably, probably so. Yeah, there, there's a there's quite a cottage industry of people, you know, uh, tinkering around and, and and taking the the mask design and trying to adapt it for both for winds and brass. So it's uh, if you told me a year ago that this was, you know, everybody was going to be wearing a mask and oh. horn players and brass players would be wearing using bell covers. And <laughs> it's fascinating I just to look around and just to see everybody. Yeah wearing a mask. It's just something that I tell all the young people. And I said, this is something you can tell your children. You mentioned tinkering and you're, you're a bit of an inventor yourself, right? You've, you've developed some things over the years to help with horn playing. I was curious if you, if you want to talk a little bit about the watt lifter and maybe yeah. share a little bit of story about that. It's interesting. I, you know, I, out of necessity, I got this uh, pain in the back of my neck and I realized I was bending to the horn. Mm-hmm. And then I would look at photos of horn sections from different eras, different time periods. And every, a lot of people would bent in a very uncomfortable way, bending to the horn. Sure. Or if I could sit up straight. So uh, the way it came about, I had a, a neighbor at that time, my next door neighbor across the street, my neighbor across the street was the set designer for the TV show MASH. Okay. He, he could make anything. And, so I had, I was asleep and I was thinking, I was using a piece of styrofoam to lift it up and all this and different things. So I had, took a nap and I had a, a dream about a, someone hit me with a boomerang in my head and I woke up, oh God, and I thought, <laughs> boomerang, that's the shape. Okay. So I drew it on a piece of paper and put little screws and then I took it across the street to my neighbor. An hour later, he came back and handed it to me. He says, is this your idea? At that time, he made it out of the most expensive plastic, Lexan, which is mm-hmm. aircraft. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's that's sturdy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I said, Lexan, you guys can't make it out of this. So he went, we went to plexiglass. But uh-huh. that's how I came up with it, you know, because being tall, it has to do with how far your your embouchure is from your, your leg, sure. if you hold on on your leg. Now, yeah, a lot of people, I sold them different places. Some people wanted bigger ones. and But now, guess what? Everybody's playing off the legs, the new generations. So, you know. You, you, Seems to be the case. But, you know, I still, I still see people using things like that from time to time. I think, you know, I think there's still a place for it. It's just something that, um, that, was, that, it, that was needed. And I was, I was always a tinkerer, I guess you could say. I was always making things. Mm-hmm. You know, as as a kid, yeah. So that just seemed to be something. And I, you know, I I have a trademark, but the the first time I took it to a patent lawyer back then, he told me he talked me out of getting a patent. He says, "Oh, how many people are going to use it?" I said, "French horn players." Oh, that's all. I said, how many of those? I said, but, you know, I don't. I, he says, <laughs> "It's not worth getting." He talked me out of getting the patent. It, and as it, and now everyone's playing off the leg. The next generation, all the generation. All the kids playing off the legs. I did the Gateways Music Festival, and all the play. They're all they're all holding <laughs> horn off the leg, and I thought, okay, so much for that. You know, isn't that isn't that interesting though? And you know, um, so you moved to Los Angeles from from the East Coast, right? From from yeah. from uh, New Jersey, right? No, from Boston. From Boston. From Boston. Okay, yeah, that's right. And. So I, I haven't spent much time at all in L.A. The only time I was there was for the International Horn Symposium in 2015. But, you know, in, in a lot of ways, a city like that is, is just overwhelming. You know, the traffic and the size. And it, what was it like making that adjustment going from not only the East Coast to the West Coast, but such a different, you know, I guess just way of life, I suppose. I think what you notice the big difference I mean, of course, be coming out of school, I didn't, I didn't have a car. I didn't own a car, so, mm-hmm. and I had, I think I had an expired New Jersey license plate, so I wasn't. I, I <laughs> came out of here, and it was Michael Tilson Thomas who told me, he says, "You gotta have wheels in LA." 
because he's, uh-huh. and I, but I think the biggest thing you notice is the space concept. Like if I go to New York, I feel, you know, restaurants, little places are almost a little claustrophobic almost. Compared, that's an element of space here is amazing. You have, you just feel there's so much more space. And sure. So because the city is spread out physically more than, you know, I mean, you can spit, fit 10 Manhattans here, you know, and this city. <laughs> spread out the way just because of the terrain right just the you know, so when i got out here in 1970 the traffic was done by 6 45 it was over oh my goodness he thinning out everything was gone you know there were less people here sure so that was an interesting concept once i got you know and i got my first car and it was very you know and of course my father had no idea he says the first thing when you get out there don't buy a car and the parents, you know. Right. As I said, not to mention there's a mountain range running through the city, but uh, yeah, I'll just walk, you know. <laughs> Everything is like a long way away, even by car. Sometimes it takes a long time to get from one side yeah. of the city to the other. And when my father came to visit once, he uh, he realized that. I he said, where are we going? I said, we're going to the market. He says, God, it's such a long way. I said, what? Well, it's just across, you know, to me, I'm not, I'm I said, it's just around the corner. But in the concept of New Jersey, that small town that we grew up in, it must have seemed like the you know the Wild West to him. You know, so. Right, right. But I I enjoyed that aspect, and then also the uh, at that time, I mean, the LA Philharmonic they had the major orchestra, you have a full schedule, but then you had the studios and uh, all that studio work out here, which was mm-hmm. a totally different element that I, I hadn't even thought about, and. Being in the LA Philharmonic, it kind of gave you carte blanche into the, to the studio contractors. They wouldn't question whether you could play it. And right. Being the only black French horn player in the major orchestra at that time, and but I had a name, uh, Boston Blackie, because uh, the guy that the most likely to succeed white guy in the city here, sub with the Philharmonic, mm-hmm. he didn't get the job. So there were people who were uncomfortable about that and i heard no one called me that but i heard people several people tell me that they heard me refer to that way and it was a whole i mean it was it was interesting but uh everything motown was here they're all the black and there was a whole group of black studio players who played a lot of the string players like a whole string quartet black with that played a lot uh-huh. of barry white and all the uh and stevie wonder so it was so you had these interesting circles you had the Circles that did uh, Disney mm-hmm. and that whole, and Decker was part of that, and then mm-hmm. did everything besides that. He did all. He did the black things. He did the white. He did, all, he did everything. But the Decker that was a yeah. You could play in one studio, and it would be all black people. And the next day you have a, an, another gig, in the same studio, and you'd be the only black person <laughs> at that time. This is early seventies. Mm-hmm. Interesting to see. And it was, it was, uh, I sometimes four things a week I'd get besides the Philharmonic, four calls. So the way they did it at the Motown and a lot of the, the commercial work was done from 11 till two at night. At I have heard that. Yeah. So I, I mean, so I'd be done at Philharmonic at 10 o'clock, 10 minute drive on the freeway to Capitol Records and playing with Barry White till 2 a.m. <laughs> oh my goodness. A totally different work. <laughs> oh God, it was. Because you'd go from the Philharmonic, you're in your tails, and then I'd go to uh, the studio, and there, all the players are black, and I walk in with my tails, and it's just how did that go over? Oh, it was just the, the humor was oh god! I mean, I loved it. It was just you're going into two different one culture to another. It was it was two trumpet level. Oscar Bashir was big, Bobby Bryant, the two of them, and I, I would walk in, and they'd say, "Here he comes." Symphony Bob, you know, it was, and, <laughs> and they would say all kinds of, all kinds of black humor, you know, like terrible, they just fun stuff. But it was interesting times, and I think that's what kept me out here—the the different playing and being in two different worlds. It's, it was just, and still playing music, you know, to go. Sure. And, you know, and Barry White would be there, and then in the studios it would be anything you wanted. So you just never knew where, what was going. So it was a, just a different world, and. Um, and Motown, they wouldn't um, they wouldn't pay any attention to the union. They'd go until then, but you didn't say anything because then you know I heard that 
can claim they are, they pay all the penalties. They just mm -hmm. the way they want it. So it's very different. It's very interesting. And and then some 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 jobs that would they stuck to the union rules and some kind of halfway. So but nobody nobody ran to the union. Mm -hmm. it's just, they said if you did that for Motown, somehow your check would get lost. And was, oh wow. And the, these are yeah, just interesting things. That, but so it made it a very interesting place to live because you're always, you know, you're getting called to do this, to, get, to do that, and then mm -hmm. there's a thing called uh, sidelining. Uh -huh. They you you're sitting on stage dressed with your instrument, but you're not playing, and they're just you're just a backdrop, and that's a diff it's a certain scale. It's not bad. it's not bad for three hours, but a lot of players do that. That would be like in a in a film or something. Yeah, like. Um, in the film Oli Oli Oxen Free, it was at the Hollywood Bowl. Uh -huh. Hollywood Bowl. And Catherine Hepburn came, landed in a hot air balloon. That was the scene. Okay. In front of the orchestra. And the tip of the, the gondola caught one of the seats, the box seats, and the thing tipped over just as it just as it was hitting the ground. And she almost got dumped out. Oh and wow. She, they ran over and caught and pulled her out and she. She was so upset. And she says, okay, Heather, you're okay. He says, we'll run that again in 10 minutes. And she <laughs> said, you'll never get me in that damn thing again. I'm going home. She, but she <laughs> left. She was so shook up. She left. Wow. And she out of stuff. And there was another one where, I don't know if they have it anymore. It was, it's an award show for art, mm -hmm. art called the Screen Awards. Uh, the Scream Awards. The Scream Awards. Scream. Oh, for horror, horror films. Yeah. yeah horror films. And Holly Berry was the hostess, and it was sidelining. So if it's sidelining, you can't play. If you right. play, then you shift. You sh you shift the whole thing. Then you're in. So if you play, then different you scale. Play. Yeah, you shift the scales exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, people people don't know. And then Holly Berry comes out. And they said, "Can we have a timpani roll?" And the guy said, "Sure." And that was it. Everybody got shipped in. Now we're all in a three-hour session. Uh-huh. Because you're, you're playing your instruments. Yeah. And we played a symphony role, and everybody went cha-ching. Wow. <laughs> the, the, the concert master, I mean, the uh, contractor was also a player. And yeah. Went, oh, boy. He says, uh-oh. You know, but the uh, producer had a cow or something. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, he said, now you, you got to play it. Pay everybody. So you had all these interesting things happening. So it made wasn't just the philharmonic, you know. So yeah, it was for a young person, it was very entertaining, you know, to live here. And there was always something different. You're playing for this commercial. So it was a very different and very uh, colorful experience, you know. I would, yeah, I, I can, I can only imagine. Now you mentioned you mentioned your book that that's the Black Horn, but you also have another book, the tip, the tips and tricks for horn yes. players, right? Yes, I. When I talk with Dale Clevenger, he had it. I have that myself. You can get that through my website. Yeah, Dale, Dale Clevenger had one. I'm going to send in my CD, um, a copy of my CD. And my record producer, the guy at the piano, when you see the picture of the CD, the piano's on the beach. Mm -hmm. It really is on the beach. How did they get that out there? They, I tell you, the director, it was a, that was originally for a short film that I produced. Uh, in memory of Miles Davis. Uh -huh. It was a friend of mine after he died. It's called Missing Miles, which became a piece of music also. But we did the short film and it also got into the same film festival that my uh, interview, Pan-African. Yeah, it's uh, it's the largest black film festival in the country now because of, or in the world. So many films, over 200 films. But that Missing Miles also got in. But what they did, I thought they... We rented the piano from a piano place, and he brought it. Then was on a dolly. Uh -huh. They used two dollies, run to roll it off the truck, and then run to get it out. And then we kept the two dollies, and he rolled the dolly on, put it on the sand, and moved the dolly, and then rolled it on the next, and kept moving it over. Oh, okay. I thought that's how they built the pyramid. Like this is the direct to figure that out. So we worked it down to the near the water. And propped it up to protect the wheels. He put stuff around to protect the wheels. And then the police came. And when, you know, for a movie, you have to have a permit. So we had a permit. Mm. And the director said, get the permit out. And the police came. They said, no, we don't. That's okay. We just want to know how in the world 
you got the piano down on the beach like that. Yeah. It's not like you just pick it up and carry it, you know. So they were, No, no, yeah. It was on its side and on a dolly. And sure. they just it across and then set it up. So, it, you know, you have to, you know, those are fun things, but uh, it was fun. Uh, so that's my record producer, Todd Cochran. You know. Oh, I have to ask you, uh, have you got a Miles Davis story you want to share? I think everybody that knew Miles <laughs> Davis probably has a Miles Davis story. Just one? <laughs> <laughs> that they can share, I guess, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, what happened is I was, uh, I was dating a Canadian woman that was a dear friend of his. And uh, I didn't know she knew him. We started dating and then in the middle of our relationship, she said, you know, I think it's time for you to meet Miles Davis. And I thought, how's that? I said, why? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She says, well, he's a friend of mine. I didn't tell you. And uh, I told him about you. And he he wants to meet you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some of his language, I don't know if this is language sense, but his language was uh, edgy. <laughs> you know. I have heard that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he, uh, he was curious about me because I used to see him whenever we did French, modern French, especially the uh, Lebec sisters, he, he knew them. Friends it. He'd be in the most expensive seat sitting way up there by himself. Uh-huh. It's miles. You know, and before I met him, I mean, years, and he would show up for Stravinsky or Debussy, any of that, he'd be there. Yeah. So then he, uh, she told him that uh, I played the Philharmonic and that, uh, and I also had a horse. I used to be a show writer, a dressage. I had mm-hmm. a dressage horse boarded a mile or so from his his home at the Malibu Riding and Tennis Club. And so he thought the day I was going to meet him, he, you know, he wanted to meet me. He said, the way he said it, you think I can meet him and you can bring him up here so I can check him out? I mean, meet him. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing my fine friend, he said he should be scared, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> he was very protective of her. Uh huh. So the day we we're going to meet, she couldn't come, and uh, she told me, "She says, uh, what do you think?" He said, "He'd be glad if you, you know, he'd be fine if you came by yourself." And I thought, "Oh God, I, you know, <laughs> he was going to cook for him, you know, and all the whole thing." And his big thing was uh, collard greens. Has an amazing history. Um, those seeds were brought over in little pouches for the captured slaves that they brought from Africa because they didn't know where they were going. There was big money in the group. It was a big crop for feeding slaves, one of the things they used to feed slaves. So it was big money in feeding slaves. It's, so collard greens is one of the big things. Right. It's such an honored kind of a dish. And I still eat I make them myself. And it's a, and it's a good plant in itself. Mm-hmm. So he was, he got up, Miles got upset because at the time, he's mad because he couldn't find collard greens in Malibu. Like, Miles, come on. Hey, what's wrong with these people? I said, no, it's not that. I said, you're in the wrong community. They're going to have collard greens. <laughs> yeah. So the day I went up there, I, uh, I went by myself. I worked my horse. And I could, you know, I, was, I could feel this, you know, you know how you're doing something, you just, there's an apprehension, you feel it in your body. Mm-hmm there until you do what you have to do. My horse could feel it, and the horse was nervous, and I just cut the thing short and went over. And um, <clears throat> My girlfriend gave me a bag of collard greens and smoked turkey wings, which is the seasoning. Some people use the seasoning. Mm-hmm. Some people use pork, you know, whatever. But it's, you know, it's such a great plant. That, so I go over there with this bag <laughs> with smoked turkey wings. <laughs> Big bag and then turkey wing. I mean, they have the grease and then you could see the spots of the bag. It was just like <laughs> this big bag. And I knock on the door and it's this giant door. And I'm like, Jesus, there's no knocker. And it's a big wooden door. And Malibu has a lot of homes. It's a kind of a fad there. We have this door that goes way up. It looks like one big door that's uh-huh. like three feet tall, but then it splits. But it looks, when you look at it, it looks like a giant door. And I thought, oh my God, look at the door. It looked like the great gate of Kiev. You know? <laughs> oh, so he would have a door like, so I knock on the door and, his, and my hand, and, and finally uh, the door opens. And his son sticks his head out, are you Bob? I said, yeah. And he pushes the door open. And then Miles is standing there with two paintbrushes looking like the crook and flail of an Egyptian pharaoh. Eyes looking right through me. And I was like, oh God. So you just, 
like he stared through to my soul. He says, come in. I said, oh, brother. I said, okay. <laughs> and he said, you're a big, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I'm just a little girl. Come in. Come in. It's, believe me, the stuff I don't think you want on your butt. The stuff. And, you know, he, and it's just part of his whole, you know, embellishment. And so that's what he said. He looked at me. I said, no. I said, <clears throat> I said, I ran into her. I was introduced to her. I said, come in, come in, come in. She said, he's going to prod you a little bit, you know, poke you a little to see what you can take. <laughs> so, so we come in and I've had the collard greens I give them to him. He says, oh, thank you, thank you. And, you know, he's just joking around. How much? I said, no, oh, this just, he says, <laughs> just kidding. So he pours them in with the other part of Green's cooking already. And I said, I said, take the string off. That's all right. I had all cook up. Oh, and I said, then he's staring them up and he said, ah, nothing like Green's. And he says, something's missing. And I said, what's missing? I don't know. But he says, who do you know can cook Green's? Where's Barbara? I said, she's at traffic school. She couldn't come. Well, who do you know can cook Green's? I said, my mother. Where's your mother? I said, New Jersey. Call her up. Call her up. I said, why? He says, call her. I want to talk to her. <laughs> I said, I call my mother. I said, the guy wants to talk to you about collard greens. Oh, okay. He gets a, uh, this what? This is Miles Davis, ma'am. Um, can you help me with these collard greens? He's talking to her like with this great, you know, respect. You know, what hope it is, darling? Yes, yes, ma'am. Very good. Then he hangs the phone up. And he said, um, this is how he was. He was so perceptive. You could get a sense of it. And he said, does your mother taught you how to hold your head up as a black man? I said, okay, how do you know? I talked to her. I said, you talk about garlic and color. <laughs> he says, I can do that. I can do that. I said, okay. So, you know, it just went on and he, he says, uh, I want to see your horse. I said, oh. I said, he's eating. He says, I know, I know. And he puts on these black jeans, black loafers, no socks, and a yellow silk jacket. Uh, and he puts he has a white t-shirt, a yellow silk jacket and he wears his cross from the Knights of Malta because he was knighted by the Knights of Malta and he puts that on, he looked like something in a magazine cover just because of his he was like model size you know, he wasn't big bone like me he just, everything he put on just looked like he looked like a model so we go up and <laughs> I had a Volvo out there and I get in and he says you want to go up there in a Ferrari? And I thought, you know, this is just a mile away. And I thought, fine, you know. <laughs> Why not, right? Yeah. <laughs> we go up and we drive up. And, you know, it just, this is the Ferrari he had in LA. He has another one in New York. And he made four million a year, something like four million a year. So I thought, okay. And, uh, you know, he says, uh, I want you to hear something. He puts some, the CD in and he says, turn it on. I don't know how to work this one. I know how to work the one in New York, but not like, I don't know. So I turned on and says, listen to that, you know. So we're driving, and then it was something he wanted me to hear. And we get to my to the stable, and I again my had already ridden the horse and he's eating. And then Miles pulls him out and looks at him. And then <laughs> this is the thing being in public with him, you just never know what's gonna happen. One of the riders, a British woman, walks up. She says, Oh, sir, that is a lovely cross. And Miles said, Thank you. I'm a knight. And she says, Why I'm British. He says, so what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh God. I thought, what do we do now? I had to get him out of there. And I thought, ah, oh, just get him back to the car. And I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> let's get in the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, you know, I have horses too. I said, really? And so he, now, so we get on the road, and again, you know, I mean, he's not here all the time. Now. It's like there's two roads that come from the Coast Highway in Malibu, in Malibu. One is Pepperdine, Malibu Canyon, and the other one's Canaan Dune Road, and they go through the same area pretty much. It looks the same. You you could uh -huh. they look you could if you didn't know where you were, you think you were on you. So he got confused. He couldn't find the horses. <laughs> we drive. We already ended up to the Ventura Freeway, and. He, We'll go back. I, I, I don't remember. Aaron Aaron takes me to his son. So he was on the wrong road. It's, so oh, no. I would look at Canyon Dune Road. They go through the same terrain. It looks exactly the same. 
And he said, Tony, he's just telling me stuff that, and he talked to you like you knew everybody he knew. And my, my girlfriend, and she told me, she says, if he talks to you like that, he, that means he likes you. I said, what? And he said, yeah, I used to talk about that to Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, and you know how he was. I said, oh. <laughs> So sure, I wasn't born, but you know, I didn't. <laughs> it was so crazy. I, I, I did, you know, and, and he used to uh, he used to box with Sugar Ray Leonard and go to the studio and box. And he said, "Yeah, he says I had to be straight when I went in there. I couldn't go in there with my head bad. Couldn't have any drugs. You know, and if I didn't, it's just you know all the stories." And I, I thought, so I get back, and he wants me to, uh, you know, he said. Uh, what did he say? Somehow a horn came up. And I used to take my horn up with me when I would ride. Uh -huh. I would warm up and do some practicing before I got on the horse. Right. Because afterwards, you didn't feel like it when you get back. So I would have the horn in the car. And I told him, I said, yeah, I already warmed up on the horn. He says, where the horn in the car? And I thought, I thought I was trying to like do it. I thought, I think it is. He says, go look, go look. So I go look at <laughs> it. Bring it in. I thought, oh, no, no. I hope he didn't want me. You know, if he was going to laugh at my jazz playing. Or, well, I didn't know what he, what he wanted. He says, uh, play something. I said, what are you doing? I played a few things. And he says, play that uh, solo when the white boys turn red. Uh, the Firebird. I said, Firebird. He said, play that solo when the white boys turn red. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay. I'm thinking, what the hell? I said, what's that? He says, way at the end, he says, this beautiful solo comes out and on the white boys turn red. He says, what's so hard about that? I said, why? I, I, I said, it's not hard. And he says, and he says, play it, play it. So <laughs> the last, the Versus, the last. Yeah, song. yeah, yeah. So I said, uh, oh, that. I said, yeah, I played it. And he's at the same time sitting there listening, eating color greens, smacking his lips. Which is good. That's beautiful. And <laughs> At the end, I, I said, I said, it's not hard. Said, it starts on an F sharp. It's not that, you know. And he said, uh, well, I said, what? When are you going to turn red? <laughs> uh, it, it's all in the book. You got It's just. Crazy. He was just, he was having a laugh with you. He was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was a straight man. He just, I walked into it all the time. It was yeah. just one of those things where you think, God, how am I going to, I had a concert that night. I, 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 it was so hard to concentrate. And uh, so I went that night at the concert and I sat down and well, Principal to Stephen sat right next to me because I was playing first on something. So Principal Trump is right now. So Tom Stevens, I said, uh -huh. and he, he always called me old man. He said, how you doing, old man? I said, uh, I met Miles Davis today and spent the whole afternoon with him. <laughs> he looked at me, really? I said, yeah. I said, I don't know how I'm going to play. <laughs> it was distracted, you know, your mind is racing. But it was sure. a good, good thing because then we would, uh, he would want your company. So Barbara, we'd go out together. He'd invite you. He'd say, why don't you all come out, come visit? No, why don't you come out to the house? I can't visit, but why don't you all come? <laughs> so he'd, come, he'd let you in. He'd go back upstairs, do what he was doing. And you had to run to the house. The house is right on the beach. You could walk out the back door and you'd be right was right on the you know on the beach side of the coast highway. So we'd go and we'd cook stuff and then he'd come down and eat something and then go back and practice. And then just before we leave, he'd come down and peek down from the steps. Nice having you. <laughs> you go. <laughs> uh, oh, that that's amazing. I, uh, yeah. You know, everybody has and Barbara would try to tell him to change his hair back to when he had a uh, short crop afro. And then at that time, he had these weaves and things hanging down. And, and Barbara tried to tell him, why don't you go back to your, that, your nice, simple, natural like before? He said, I can't do that. I'm too hip for that now. <laughs> it was, I'm too hip. But listening to that, you just, it, it's kind of the way an improvisational mind thinks. I can mm -hmm. go back. I have to always go forward, play something new. What's the new idea? What's coming up? And he... He could do that. He could, uh, you know, he just thought that way. I can't go back. I'm too hip. <laughs> so it was that. Con constantly reinventing himself. Yeah, yeah. That, all those guys thought, you know. And, yeah. I mean, they just, oh my God. Some of the stories are just, the, the famous, I can tell, the limousine story where he and Charlie Parker in the limousine. 
Yes, <laughs> these guys were just amazing. I mean, Charlie Parker was just, and Charlie Parker, they used to do gigs. I mean, he would play bar mitzvahs and everything. So they could read, they could, you know, both of them could read like crazy. So they did interesting jobs, but what a, I mean, they was, their lives were so edgy. I mean, they were so. Larger than life. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that story, I never, oh man. I mean, just things that uh, you just, you just couldn't imagine, but that's who they were. And that's why, that's why their music was so amazing, but they could play stuff together. How they thought together and dizzy too, the way they would. So I bebop was so difficult because these guys, the way they would play things, you have they had some of the ideas, right? but they would play it together like an octave apart, you know. Most people could never follow, but they right stick together like that, and uh, that's why Gunther Schumann was so fascinated, you know. With this. I mean, that the era was such a such an amazing time. Um, I, I just kind of wish. I mean, it was great to meet him, but. I don't know if I wanted to live during that time as a musician, but uh, I don't know. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm sort of glad that, you know, when I got to L.A. that I had the balance and I had both that, you know, getting to play with Stevie Wonder and <clears throat> Ray Charles. And, because the, with those guys, it was you're sort of like being in a concert and playing a gig at the same time because half, half the music you weren't playing with them. They were just mm-hmm. playing. You have to listen and then you, when you're part, and they, they would, and then the rest of the show was with the, with the with the band, and so you got to watch, and sit and watch and listen to them play, and they were so, uh, they'd come out. Stevie Wonder would come out, and they just they had such warm personalities. And he said, "All right, my people, let me warm up a little bit here." And he just warm up in front of us, and, and he says, "Okay, let's try this one." Uh, you know, and, and the conductor, it was just uh, such a almost like a privilege to be able to do both of these musicians, but then to play and perform with pop and jazz players, you know, it's just mm-hmm. such a, so that's what kept me in LA, I can tell you, because of <clears throat> that edgy kind of life where you're doing stuff, different stuff all the time, you know. There's only a few places in the world where so many different things can be found in the same city. I mean. Yeah, I mean, you remember the, uh, they called, they made a movie out of it. It was called Watts Stack. It was after the Watts riot in kind of like a, a truce concert for after the Watts riots. And they, it took place in the LA, uh, the Coliseum mm-hmm. near which well, USC is what they didn't buy, it, but they leased it. So that's where USC uses for its football games. Mm-hmm. So the Coliseum now they have USC on it. And Isaac Hayes was one of the big players and they built the scaffold in the middle of the stadium in the middle of the field and we had to climb up to get to the concert to the top of the scaffold and oh wow they put on the, the coliseum was full with people and it was i mean amazing huge like a football game climb up and i played it was isaac hayes and well that was hairy because <laughs> the whole new thing would blow the wind it would kind of rock and we're thinking we're going to die up here you know you didn't sign up for that when you signed up to play the gig. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember the car and it was, but those were, <clears throat> so those were the things. There was a, a couple of black contractors that, so, but I played for everyone. I mean, I did Disney, I did everybody, I did Fox, I did all of them. So it was very, uh, very interesting just to have the diversity and to see all of that. So it was a, it really it was quite a, a, a period. That's what I'm sure kept me here as a musician arm with all these different the different genres just and get paid you know well that you know it and it occurs to me i mean you mentioned miles and and charlie parker and it'd be these sort of larger than life figures but you you've had such an impressive career as well and you you i mean you may not know this but you're certainly a role model for a lot of people out there um and you know i i hope that they that they listen to this podcast and you know in terms of trying to make the classical music world more open, more equitable, more opportunities for all different kinds of people. I mean, where, where do you think we go from here? Where do you think we, what, what, what should we be trying to do? Or in your opinion, is there, is there, where, where do we, where do we go down that path? Yeah. The, uh, I think I mentioned slightly in my first book, um, 
we have to realize what was done in the past and why. Why would the classical music world exclude certain people? And I, from my experience, I did found it had to do with, from my experience of dealing with white classical musicians, I had the feeling that it had to do with cultural identity. So mm -hmm. that time, the United States had a had a cultural identity, but it was insecure about it. People coming from Europe, their ancestors were not playing, performing, and listening to necessarily. They were you no know, most of the Americans that came were working for feudal lords, so they were <clears throat> the low classes of Europe. They didn't have the culture, so coming. That's why that, that gives the United States had this sense of. I say a cultural inferiority complex because it didn't really have a culture because people came here and they had to make something. So when they look back on these, so these descendants of white Europeans coming to America, now the musician descendants look back to Europe as a cultural touchstone, almost on their knees to it because then that gives them a sense of identity, cultural identity. Yet they're insecure because they don't really know or you know, if their, their ancestors were actually involved in this music. And so it, they don't, they, they cling to it almost because it's like, oh, this is something that you know, they sought after, this is our identity. And identity is a powerful thing with uh, human beings. If you're insecure about your identity, your cultural identity, and then another person comes in that has definitely has a well-defined cultural identity as i.e. a black person, coming in playing uh, classical music, playing a violin or something that is not typically black music and black music instrument. And some people get very upset about it because you kind of invade their cultural identity. That's one of the big things. So that's why for years that, that I believe they kept black people out because they didn't care how well you played, you were not going to get an audition. You wouldn't even. And I learned from some of the uh, the jazz players, uh, one uh, Harry Sweets Edison, famous jazz trumpet player, who played, you know, um, with all the, the big names in the, with, and he said that there were always guys who could, who learned all that literature and studied with, uh, you know, and all the different you know, trumpet players, for example, but they couldn't get an audition. They couldn't mm -hmm. go. They couldn't even you couldn't even be let into an audition. You could show up, but they wouldn't let you. So he said those guys would end up going on the road with Fletcher Henderson, you know, mm -hmm. and because that's all they could get. And he said, doesn't matter how well you play. And he says, some of those guys, he said, they have a term, they said that for a good sight reader, he says that some of those guys could read around the corner, but even so, they wouldn't, couldn't get an audition. It's that sense of invasion and someone's identity is very important. So if you, if you invade or if you, you challenge someone's identity can be very uh, unsettling. And so that's what I believe is, is the idea of keeping black folks out of it. Singers, okay, I mean, yeah, there was, that's not such, that's not a, those are the ones that first got in, you know, and singing was a little more acceptable, but uh, playing a French horn, you show up, my God, trumpet or any other instrument. My father auditioned for Juilliard, he played and he had a band and there's a picture of him behind the heels and, and they had a, a dance band and he could read. In fact, there's a guy who's still alive who kind of told me what kind of player my father was. You imagine he's someone now telling you that your father, he says your father was the best reader, but he wasn't the best improviser. <laughs> to know that at such a late date that your father has been gone you know, for 20 years. And, but um, so my father, it was my, namesake, Robert Lee Booker, who was also a trumpet player in New York, mm -hmm. who told my father to, uh, he says, why don't you try out for Juilliard if you get, get in there, you know, you're going to be a lot, you can get a good education. Mm -hmm. So my father went and he played like Stella by Starlight. He had a great tone. And they said, very nice, Mr. Watt. Um, uh, you have a very nice tone. Now can you play some of the prescribed audition material mm -hmm. um, to hear the uh, Bach Wedding cantata, BWD 351, use your D trumpet. <laughs> he left, he, he bolted out. And he, that was traumatic for him because he told me later, just before I, 
I went to conservatory and then he'd audition. I didn't know he'd audition. And he told me when I, before I left the conservatory, be sure to get a music education degree so you can have something to fall back on. Do they have that at the conservatory? I said, yes. He says, make sure you do that. I said, why would I want to fall back? He says, in case you don't make it on the, in the classical music, you have something to fall back on. I'm thinking, fall back. It just didn't, it didn't jive with me at the time. But he said, if you think they're going to take N word in one of those orchestras, you're crazy. That's what he, and I thought, and I told him that that was my last, you know, before I left the school, I said, uh, I said, but I said, for once and for all, I'm not. That's not how I see myself. So don't call me that, you know. But he, uh, <clears throat> that was, it was very traumatic. He, he thought that, that you want to play that Lily White, ta, 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 that Lily White classical stack. He said, that. He says, there you go. Oh, he, he, so that must have really uh, traumatized him to have to run out because he didn't know. And eventually I talked to him. He says, why did you get that BWB? What the hell is that? I said, I bought work for Cypress. I said, it's somebody who put box works in order. No, it's not. I said, it's nothing. What <laughs> I never had a D trumpet. I never heard of a D trumpet. I only had one horn. I don't know. All those crackers, what the hell do they want? You know, he was uh, you know, <laughs> so upset about that. And uh, But we had a good uh, moment uh, before he passed away. He smoked all his life, so. He asked me, I was home visiting, he asked me to play the, uh, to play something, I had my own there. And I said, how about the uh, Carnival of Venice Variations? Because I said, the one in the back of your Arben trumpet book. Because I, I took his book, stole his book and took it. And, oh, and I said, there was one variation that had 64 notes and you told me if I could play that, then it would, I'd be a player. And you know, the last variation that has, and I thought, he says, you can play that on that horn? I said, yeah. I didn't think it was that technical. I said, yes. He says, you have the music? I said, no, I have it. So I played a couple of the variations. And he couldn't believe Scott. So I didn't know you were that good. Yeah, but, yeah he, he didn't. He just, he never liked the French horn. He always thought, he thought of it. He had it confused a little bit with a mellophone. You, you never get the melody because the mellophone goes the other way. So he was thinking, he played in the Elks band, you know, and guys that would play, he calls it a peck horn. That's what says, you never get to melody, you just play the offbeats. And I said, no, no, I said, you <laughs> so, Oh, that Elk band was something, those guys. I mean, all these old guys from World War II vets. That, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I think there's a guy that I describe in the book, a trumpet player, who never listened. He'd always, that Elk band, all these guys, he'd be playing the wrong tune. He, he didn't hear well. My father was a, yeah, Porterfield. He says, yeah, yeah, anyway. He's a number three, not number six. He'd be playing a Star Spangled Banner and he'd be playing it a totally loud. Yeah. And he couldn't hear it. At all. Okay. Then you had the plumber, Johnny Green, who played sousaphone, and he could, he, you could hear him three blocks away. <laughs> I mean, amazing. It was, what a crew. I mean, it's, uh, oh, God. You know, you're just, your mind, you're collecting all these, these characters were so, uh, there was that Porterfield was such a character and my father would get, you know, upset with him because of the things that he would do. And there was a, we were at a, uh, you know, on a parade where it stops, mm -hmm. everything gets backed up, everybody's whole waiting. And Porterfield goes over to this white guy and says, uh, uh, he pulls the guy's coat down uh, sir, I just I just want to say, uh, y'all all right with me? Y'all all right with me? And the guy said, well, thank you. And he says, I loves everybody. And my father was like, what the hell are you doing? He says, the man don't give a damn about you. <laughs> just the scenes of things that would happen. My father was so upset. He says, you make you embarrass us. <laughs> you know, a lot of times the, the guys were drinking. I mean, it was such a bad. I mean, it would have made a great film, you know, when you think back on that, you know, the guy. So I think my writer instincts, I mean, I think back on those characters that, you know. Well, I imagine that was useful as a musician being able to, you know, we talk about oh, French music, you have to be in a certain character, Germanic, romantic music, you have to be in a certain character, being able to to channel those different styles and being able to to produce them is, is probably something that's been very useful. And understanding, you know, just personalities. And you, I mean, you sit and you listen um, I mean, if you listen to Berg and you listen to Debussy, I mean, God, I mean, there's no, I mean, it's such an amazing contrast. Some of the things I, what's the, the uh, 
Is it the Webern five pieces where that one variation that has the horn comes in on a high B flat? It says three notes and it's it's a tone row, but it's three notes, 42 beats to the quarter, and they're half notes. I did that with Boulez. It's so slow. And you think, and then you play, you know, Debussy or you know, the, the different characters in the music, and then Ravel and the, the different feel and that um, Ravel was it that came to the United States and met with Gershwin. And that's why that piano concerto, Ravel piano concerto has that big solo in it. But then it sounds like, like blues because he heard the stuff. So you hear it and you're like, that's blue. That's, you know, you, you hear, it's like, wow. So they, they ended up meeting. And, you know, you, and I always thought in my interview, I was often thought what, what it would have been like if Mozart had heard the blues. And Beethoven, because they were both improvisers, just like uh -huh. us do today. They did that then. And I think now that's becoming a new thing where pianists are not playing somebody's cadenza. They're improvising. I, heard, I mean, I, I just got out just after that. Uh, someone like Brendel do that because he was that kind of intellect, you know, they would and play the cadenza as a jazz soloist, a jazz pianist. That's the new classical. That's what I heard. There's some people doing that, which, which was... You know, fascinating stuff too. Well, I think it's kind of come full circle. You know, they music curriculums in different schools are starting to to realize the importance of students actually learning learning to create their own things, being improvisers, creating their own compositions. Um, you know, we we spend so much time specializing in our one little slice of oh. of the musical world that we kind of lose sight of of the whole picture. And that's why in the interview, my you right with Todd Cochran, he says, you know, what do you think about the, you know, blurring of the, the genres? And I thought, you know, I think, so I was saying, it was a shame we had to think about it blurring because it it's all music. So why do, you know, because people get so hung up on separating the genres. And then you see something like that Ravel piano concerto that sounds like Gershwin. What? Because the two of them met and they studied with the same Nadia Boulanger. And Nadia Boulanger said about uh, Gershwin that she told him to not take himself so serious as a composer. And who else? And Boulez studied with her. And um, who's the other? Boulez's teacher studied with her also. Copeland and uh, Quincy Jones also. And Asa Pekas Solomon didn't study with her because that she was gone by then, but he studied with that same school. He talked, he said, he told me that uh, he studied with that from that same school of, of teaching. So they, uh, so she was quite a, quite a teacher. You know, it's just fascinating how, if you just, you know, you would think if we just let people mix and get together, it was amazing what would happen. You know, I mean, you hear that, that real bell, that's like, it's Gershwin. You're like, that's yeah. you know, Those chords, you're like, oh my God, and Chick Corea hmm. playing Mozart G minor. Yeah, good shit. Sure. Yeah, oh God, and Bobby McFerrin conducting at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. I tell you, I thought this is going to be interesting. You know how it starts with the uh, the beginning of that concerto, the string, the yum pom pom pom, the yum pom, the yum pom 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 pom, but has the little syncopation. So Chick Corea says, "Can they lay back on that syncopation?" <laughs> like what? Bobby McFerrin's like what? He says, "Very pop 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 pop." pop. I mean, lay it out. <laughs> oh God! I mean, I was in stats. Like, this is going to be fun. So then when he Chick does the cadenza, my God, he had such tries playing and he put a double eighth diminished 13th chord. Whoops, oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't get into the, 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 the right idiom. Oh, it was so funny to watch. I mean, everything else was fine, you know, technically, but he got, you know, they can't do this. Oh, they can't do that. And, my, and Todd came to that concert, he thought he'd shake his head. He says, that was interesting to see. But, you know, to, to, to see, to have, you know, I guess to have lived or to have known about the different genres, it's a fascinating thing as musicians to would have been amazing if Mozart could live today and see what we've done. I mean, they wouldn't, yeah. they, they wouldn't judge it. They would, they would be like, wow, that's fascinating, you know. So yeah. that, those kind of things were always uh, interesting to me. Um, but the thing now, I think um, probably the hardest thing was having the love of music that I had and getting in an orchestra 
and seeing that some that every player didn't have didn't share that same thing with you. Some right. players, like for example, we had a player who just had so much trouble starting a note mm-hmm. that it created a whole personality. A person had trouble with certain things that couldn't hear before the solo, they're testing the notes and the, they're so busy trying to do the craft that they can't embrace the whole genre of music. To meet people like that, it does affect their personality. So they're in like a whole nother, almost like survival mode, but they had enough skills to stay in the music. Those were disturbing to see that there are players like that who couldn't, you know, and right. they, they somehow got over, you know, and got a job and ended up, and, but they're struggling all the time. That was a tough thing. And, it's it's uh, because I don't think in you couldn't do that in other fields like jazz. If you, if you couldn't start a note, you wouldn't you would last. You know. Yeah. Well, Bob, this has been amazing. I, I mean, you have you have such a well of experience and, and knowledge and I, I wish we could, I wish we could share it all. Um, I just want to make sure our listeners know about the three part series in the horn call. Uh, oh. The third, the third part will be out in the October issue uh, part two in the May issue. And then February of course was, was part one. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Um, just as maybe as we kind of wrap things up, th- this being an, an IHS podcast, is there, you know, anything you'd like to share about the, the Horn Society or, or maybe what it's meant to you or uh, any any words of encouragement for folks to, to join the society and to support it? Yeah, and it's 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 very, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of thrilling to see that a whole society or a magazine, a whole organization is run by French horn players. <laughs> you never uh, perceived that. Right, no, I thought in a lot of the... Uh, the black horn players back east, where they're, most of them, they, one guy was so excited to see my face, and then he wrote all capital. That's what I'm talking about. They had never seen a black face on the magazine. Is that correct? I don't. I'm pretty. Sh- I don't recall, but I mean, well, I'm I, I'm I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad that one that that you were were felt honored by it, and I'm I'm honored that we were able to to put your story into the into the journal. So. But yeah, and it's great for the, I mean, there are more black kids in conservatory classical music now than ever. Mm-hmm. And, for them, and then also for the young white kids to see that, you know, things are changing. Things are not, you know, going to mm-hmm. stay the same. So it's good for the young people. That's, that's the reason that, uh, you know, I'm glad to, to do it for that reason also. And knowing, because it it's, was a very strange thing to show up in a field and, to realize that something you really wanted to do that nobody like you looked that looked like you was doing it, and you kind of go, "Whoa!" You know that feeling of what did everybody else know that I didn't? You know. Mm. And now there's so many more. You know, all these black horn players. There's a black French horn players webpage. It's, oh, it's and everybody thinks I started. I did not start, but I'm all over the page. But it's just amazing to see all the young players and. I have two great players out here in LA, um, one at UCLA and one just graduated from uh, USC. And they are, they're, they're working on the Kulau, they're playing the Kulau. And it's, it's uh, the, the, the young lady, Madison, uh, I lent her a D drill <laughs> for the loan. And she was so excited. I said, oh, by the way, uh, try this. Oh, no, she was falling down a hole. I said, yeah, I think it's a D drill. Because when I first met her, she contacted me online and was asking what, what school to go to. And, and she thought that she had full lips. And this, all these questions had come up before. Full lips. What thin lip professor will accept me? I was like, what is she? So she comes out and I said, you're going to audition for UCLA. Drop by, let me hear you play before. So she had never seen a screw room mouthpiece. I said, uh, and she was so excited. I said, um, you know, and I hope the mouthpiece that I, she had, I hope I never see that. It, it was, a, I don't know how she, you know, high school horn. You know. Right, right. Oh, my God. And so I showed her the screw room. Oh, that is so cool. She had no idea. So then I said, uh, keep your rim. I said, let me put this uh, new cup on. And she said, wow, this is so much easier. So when she comes, I let her. When they work with it, they come to my house and they work on it. 
I said, I'm gonna let you use it when you're here, but I want you to work on it with the regular mouth. She has my exact mouthpiece. I said, I want you uh -huh. to work with this mouthpiece so that when you come here, you, it'll be like, you know, a treat. And then you can certainly use it in the performance. And, uh, but, you know, just to show her, you know, that, but she's doing great with either way. And it's, it's you know, the, the, you know the piece, right? It's a, Oh yeah, yeah, the concertino, yeah, yeah. Yeah, lots of low horn stuff, and she's having a good time. But oh, yeah. it gets down there, yeah. It's like down on low G's and stuff, yeah. Yeah, crazy skips. So she's enjoying that. But uh, so that the stuff that I do, that you know, working with the young people. So that's that's my thing to to uh, to teach. I really enjoy inspiring young players. Uh, it's a it's an interesting it's interesting to see that things are slowly changing. That you know that. Black kids can see a black face on on the horn call, and oh, okay. So, but I'll tell you, having your face on the cover of a magazine causes lots of social eddies, as I'd say. Like, I, I never expected Dale Clevenger to call me up and invite me. <laughs> but he called me. Wow, you know. So he, uh, yeah, he's he's a uh, one of those the good ones that that care about the kids. You know? so, well, this has been fantastic, Bob, and thank you so much. Pleasure.